Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Jerry and Matt Willie of Willie Knives. My guests are the second generation owners of Willie Knives, a company started by their father who made, collected, and sold knives his entire life in the farmlands of Delaware. On a recent family getaway to Rehoboth Beat, my wife spotted the Willie Knives sign on the side of the road, which led to an amazing chance visit at this knife world bastion. We'll dig into the history of Willie Knives and find out what it's like owning a brick and mortar knife store. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, click this show. Uh, let uh, share the show with your with your friends, and uh, click the bell for notifications. If I haven't mentioned that, also, if you want to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon by going to theknifejunkie.com/patreon. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com/patreon. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self defense companion. Featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super sharp, crenulated bezel, and a built in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch, the knifejunkie.com slash shockwave. Jerry and Matt, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Oh, yeah, it's great to see you again. It hasn't been that long. It was actually on my birthday that I came to your awesome store. Uh, as I mentioned, my wife spotted the sign, but we were on the way to Delaware, uh, to Rehoboth Beach. And on the way back, I said, on the way back, we're stopping here. <laughs> my wife said, for sure. And it happened to be my birthday and I got my birthday knife at your store. Nice. Uh, and if anyone's interested, it's the Cold Steel Tie Light 6. So thank you so much for uh, hosting us. I know you were just about to close shop when we rolled in. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, so my birthday knife at your store, it was a real uh, pleasure. It was also really nice to find out about that, about your whole outfit and the history of your store. Um, tell us about your father, Gerald, and how this company started. Yeah, Jed grew up on the farm next door to us here. And he just loved knives ever since he was a kid. And when he was 10... He started making knives on the farm. He took old saw blades and would, they had machinery on the, on the farm and he would just kind of shape it out, shape out the blade and put a handle on it. And then when he was 15, his father and grandfather taught him how to use the forge and he started forging some blades and it just grew from there. And when he got out of school, he, um, got some jobs, but he kept making knives on the side. Then he ended up in the Navy for four years during Vietnam in the mid sixties to the late sixties. And when he got out of the Navy, he, um, he had started, he had a shed out here and he had a machine shop and that he finished that up and he didn't have enough money to really just do this full time. So he got a, job at the Dover Air Force Base doing what he did in the Navy, civil service, and made knives on the side and was open at in the evenings and on Saturdays. In he did that started that in 1970 when he finished the shed and started doing the knives more on the side. And then in 75, um, him and mom built the house. They lived in a just a single wide trailer in the beginning. They built the house in 75 he designed the basement to move down to be the store and he started selling more retail as opposed to just his handmade knives and he sharpened knives and it just grew into what it is today. So you're sitting right there in the basement of that house that your dad uh, designed and uh, you walk in and, and from the outside, it looks like a regular house. You walk in, right. it is, it's a full, uh, full throttle knife shop with, you have about 40 brands or so, um, or, or more probably always growing, um, you know, our favorite national brands and all that. Um, Matt, was, were, did your dad um, sort of uh, infuse the love of knives into your generation? Yes, he did. Um, 
I think when we were we were young, it was just him and mom. Mom did the bookkeeping, um, and he was just busy with making knives and, and sharpening. And honestly, at how we grew up when I was younger, we didn't have a choice. I mean, we had to be down here. So you just <laughs> it's part of life. When you get off school and you get your homework done, you came down and the shop was open from seven to nine. So we that was kind of our, our tour label. when we were younger. <laughs> but eventually, it, it grows into a love and. Um, I ended up working somewhere else for about five years. Uh, and then I realized I really miss being at the knife shop. And, um, so it was just something that, that came along over the, over the years. But, uh, yeah, I, I love being down here and, and dad just always, I mean, it was our whole life was revolved around knives. Even when we went to Rehoboth beach on the weekends, we would go out and get a bite to eat at the beach and it wasn't nearly as packed back then, but, um, we always went out to eat and he'd do a couple of deliveries. Uh, he didn't have as many restaurants back then as we do now, but we'd just kind of make a night of it and, and went out and ate and delivered some knives to some restaurants, sharpened some stuff. And it was, it was a big part of our lives. And, and now I wouldn't, it's, it's an awesome, it's an awesome thing. We're blessed to have it. So uh, was there farming still happening or was that uh, um, when he was just growing up? Is, is this happening while other stuff is happening? Yes. Yeah, so my grandfather was the farmer. Dad never got into farming. Obviously, he had to work on the farm when he was growing up. But yeah, him and his brother, neither one farm. So when my grandfather retired, um, we just ran out the fields, you know, and somebody else tills it. Another farmer tills it now. Oh, that's cool. Okay. So it, it, that allows for all, all of the time now to, to be devoted to not now, but it allowed all the time to be devoted to knives and sharpening. When you said we have a couple of restaurants, I was, I was like, I think I knew what you meant, but uh, I, it didn't mean that you own restaurants. It means that you service restaurants. Uh, tell us how that works now. I, I, and before you do, uh, let, let me let me just say I used to work at a restaurant um, during the summers uh, in high school and college, and <clears throat> I had a love for my uh, love for knives my whole life. And no one ever needed certain knives that were always delivered sharpened, like the big long butcher knives. We just didn't use, so those would become my knives, and they're like basically having swords uh, in. So it was always very exciting to have brand new sharpened knives delivered kind of on a regular basis. Is this the kind of thing you do? Right. So we have about 90 some restaurants we service. Whoa. They get delivered to every two weeks. So a decent part of our business is the sharpening side. Matt does all the sharpening and we have a couple part-time guys that help him back there. They polish when, when he's sharpening. But yeah, so I'm on the road three days every other week. So every two weeks, all the restaurants have two sets. Basically, there are knives. We own them. We lease them out. So I drop off a sharp set, pick up the dull set every other week. So what's the brand you lease out? It's just a generic brand. It's more of a grinder's knife, you know, kind of inexpensive knife. They're, they're a little hard on them. These are more for the prep cooks. Like yeah. some of our chefs, they use their own personal knives that are higher end, you know, some of the Japanese and and German knives that we also sell here. But um, yeah, the rental knives are just very inexpensive grinder knives. Yeah, we had, I think Mund Mundial and uh, I think we had Chicago Cutlery or Chicago oh, yeah. Knife Works or something uh -huh. uh, one of the, with the uh, with the plastic handles that yeah. are that are melted onto the hand. I, I actually love those knives. And uh, when I first moved out of my parents house you know i that that was the kind of experience i had so i sought out those kind of knives and had them for a long time i think i gave them to my cousin or something but um yeah the the uh you know just getting them fresh with a fresh edge right. every every week we got it i think every week uh was like okay i got dibs on this one and everyone kind of <laughs> scrambled for their for their favorite knives. I want to go back to your dad uh, till we continue because over your shoulder, Jerry, uh, I see the the um, the first knife and the last knife made by your father. And I'd love to show that off just to give a little, well, some history. And they're, they're both really beautiful. And it's cool that you have it in this case. I don't know if it's a glare. So yeah. can you, can you show, can you uh, remove them and just kind of hold them up? Yeah. 
so the first one I'm showing you is the one he made when he was around 10 on the farm, um, just out of a, a saw blade on the farm. Just a simple little, simple little design. I love that. It's a, it's a beautiful clip. Hold that up for a sec. I just want to soak that up so it's a beautiful clip point blade uh it looks like to be about four and a half or four and three quarters inches long it's got that integrated finger guard and a full tang and two they look like walnut handle slabs and made by a 10 year old this is a uh this definitely shows promise you know obviously that, that's a pretty uh excellent first knife especially for a 10 year old and uh and then his his last one um that he made a Bowie was, I'd say he was what around 75 when he made this or 76. It was, um, that yeah, cool. probably around 2020 um, when he made that one. He passed in 2022. Wow, he used a lot of a lot of 440 C and 154 CM, uh, for years on, on most of his pieces and. Of course, his trademark was the little Delaware symbol with the yeah. the Willie inside of it, and um, but yeah, so if, he, he loved the bow. I'm sorry, can you hold that back up? If you're just listening, uh, what uh, the the last knife that Gerald Willie made that we're looking at right now is a looks to be about a ten and a half inch uh, double edge. <laughs> It's it looks kind of like an Arkansas toothpick and, and a Bowie almost put together with that <laughs> S guard and a and a beautiful contoured red micarta handle i think man yeah. that thing is uh that is gorgeous and it's also kind of kind of in a in a very american school style of knife uh it doesn't look like a randall it doesn't look like uh um you know a sog but it it uh, you know an old mac v sog but it has some of that spirit what how would you describe uh you know your father's style of knife design and knife making i think Randall probably had a, an influence um, on him. In fact, years ago, he would get some blades from Randall um, and put handles on them. In fact, him and Randall made a knife for each other. He made a knife for um, Bo Randall. Bo Randall made a knife for him. They exchanged knives wow. um, back in the day. A le uh, legendary, you know, uh, Bo Randall is... is legendary but there are a lot of people uh, that whose names uh are, don't come as readily and and uh and people like your you know father have a, a lot of history of knife making in in the knives they put out what were the kind of knives he mostly made what was he known for what did people buy from him the most mostly hunting knives he he did a lot of hunting knives um a drop point was one of his popular ones and he did a couple skinners too but yeah the hunting hunting style blades was a solid seller yeah, around here especially we have a lot of white-tailed deer hunters oh yeah yep and and that's the real you know the real use the real need is uh you know hunting and and that kind of thing uh i of course am a collector so i and any any sort of knife that's really well made is um you know, going to be attractive to me and it's going to be something that I'm going to want to collect. So you're sitting there in a store, uh, in a knife store. How do you decide what to sell? Uh, it can't be just what appeals to you. Um, what is it? Dad actually uh, made that comment to us before, you know, you can't always just, just buy stuff that you like. I mean, everybody has different tastes. So um, that's why there's so many different flavors, ice cream, he would say. So we like, good brands. You know, we, if we added another company to the store, we like to, to really think about it, research them. Um, it could be two years before we actually add them. Um, it's just gotta be a good fit for us. We like to promote more USA products, um, the best we can, but yeah, good quality. Um, Good styles is what we like to, you know, something reliable, good people to deal with. Yeah. I mean, you had some, uh, you, had, you have Chris Reeve knives there. You have Spartan blades. You have McHenry Williams. You have some really um, 
uh, highfalutin knives. And then you have some, uh, you have Condor, which I love, but is, um, you know, it's made in El Salvador. So it's made in the Americas. And, right. uh, and, and those are robust kind of high value knives. So you kind of seem to, to cover the gamut. Um, I, of course, got the cold steel. You have, uh, you know, a lot of that there too. Um, what, when you're figuring out what company to go for besides, uh, you know, American and, and trying to keep things like that, what are some of the, what are some of the qualities you go for? Is it uh, stuff that gets bought more or are you more kind of presenting things to your clients? I mean, customers will ask about different companies. Um, it's kind of hard. We can't, you know, the room, the space we have right now, we don't really have the room to add too many more companies. So it's kind of difficult. We've been with companies for many years. We started with Victorinox was actually the first company dad had added. And that was the guys that were buying some of his hunting knives. They were like, you know, we need to get a nice knife for our wife for the kitchen. And Victorinox was the first company he added in 1970. Hmm. And in 73, he added Buck and Case. Um, and then it just kind of grew from there. But yeah, we've had really long relationships with with some of these companies we've been with buck and case for you know, just over 50 years now, but you know, the, some of the, comp the customers will ask for different companies, but a lot of times they do rely on us because some of the companies they don't hear about, you know, if they don't do as much advertising when we put in um, white river, um, which is a great company. We really like them. Awesome quality good family, um, great service, but a lot of our customers hadn't heard of them. You know, it's just, they weren't as well known at the time. They are more now, but yeah, yeah sometimes, especially in our area, you know, a lot of the people aren't going to hear about companies like that. Matt, you were mentioning, uh, when I was there that white river is your favorite, I think, uh, currently, um, what what about the White River knives? Do you like? Uh, and and I'll I'll say this is because I was uh, really wanted to get that uh, small EDC. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're about to start talking, but I really wanted to get that small EDC that's very popular. And then I saw all the other ones in in the cabinet, and I just haven't gotten one yet. Uh, everyone loves them. What do you love about them? Um, first off, I I really like the family. The family is really nice to deal with. Um really nice people uh just a small family company out of michigan um great people um but obviously the quality is there um you can't go wrong with g10 s35 vn they're starting to deal a little bit in magna cut now mm -hmm. um but just just a great quality knife and they're they're fit in the hand the designs they're coming out with um they don't have an enormous amount of knives to pick from like some of the other companies, but the pieces they come out with, I feel like they put a lot of thought into. Um, and for me, for my hand, I really like the feel of a lot of them and they hold an edge. Well, they use a better quality steel. Um, yeah, that overall, I mean, it's just, just one of my favorites as far as fixed blades go. I, I think that they are um, a good gateway company for people trying to learn how to not trying to learn, but people who are trying to get into carrying fixed blades. Uh, a lot of people try neck knives because they generally tend to be smaller and a lot of people don't like having them around their neck and sometimes they'll give up or, or they'll try the pocket fixed blades. Uh, I feel like the uh, White River knives are, are a good place to start. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Isn't that what you carry, Matt? Don't you carry a... Uh, not an everyday carry. I'm not as much of a fixed blade guy on everyday carry. I, I do like my White Rivers for, for camping, um, but that's that's about it. I don't do as much hunting as I used to, but as far as camping, I really love White River, and I collect some White Rivers, too. I'm big into fixed blades as far as collecting, so I do have a couple other limited pieces that I have put away uh, that I get to pull out once in a while and admire, but um, yeah, so so more of my White Rivers probably are collecting, but uh, they're a great use user knife as well, more than anything, really. 
So what does what is a guy who grew up in a knife store who owns a knife store what what do you collect? Like what are some of your prized uh, pieces? Um, I've got some some limited edition Sogs uh, back when they were a lot in in Japan. Um, I've got mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Buck limited edition knives. That's it's a lot of my collection is is limited numbered stuff. Um, but I would say from the eighties to to now, I don't have as many now as I did, I would say eighties and nineties stuff, probably more of, but I like a lot of numbered stuff. A lot of pieces just like I've got a white river with the snake wood handle, the mosaic pins and mm -hmm. things like that, that kind of stick out to me that I really enjoy collecting. Um, and I've got the, the FDE, uh, Pacific, uh, from Chris Reeve, stuff like oh, that. Too. Oh, that's oh, that's yes. one of my favorites. Um, so things like that stick out to me here and there, but I'm, I'm, I carry a lot of, a lot of folders mostly. The Pacific that was designed by, um, by, uh, Bill Harsey Jr. Right. Yes. That is one of the, I mean, of, of, of all of the, and there are many, um, people don't maybe know this, but there are a lot of different Chris Reed fixed blade knives, but of all of them, that Pacific, that is my absolute favorite. Um, uh, I think he designed that, uh, for for Chris Reeve and some like Green Beret unit or something like that, uh, man. All right, well that's a coveted piece right there. Yeah. Um, I also have an affinity for the old Sogs. Um, you know, when I was comparing your father's last knife to a Sog, I was talking about those old ones, not yeah. kind of what they're doing right now, which is you know that's fine if you the like that kind of thing. Sog, the demo. Yeah. Yeah. What's this? The demo. The Sog demo. No. You remember? Oh, okay. Oh, is it an old one? Yeah. Yeah, it was an older one. The scuba demo was a, yes, kind of a the, double edge and saw back. Yes, yes, I have seen that. I, I, I love that, and and I like the idea of numbered knives. As I uh, grow in my collecting, I've gotten into a lot more um, custom fixed blade knives, and I've co-designed a few uh, with some. Uh, 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 custom makers and we've numbered them and we're going to do a special thing with the numbering now. Uh, I, I have to uh, ask you this on your logo. It's Hebrews. Speaking of numbers, Hebrew 412. Uh, what is, what is that uh, verse and what's the significance? So the verse is the word of the Lord is sharper than a two edged sword. So I think dad, mom and dad both were very um, devout Christians and passed that on to us as well. And just the word is active and alive. And then it, of course, it had the word sword in it. So dad like that, you know, so <laughs> it's just been a part of our logo for ever since I can remember. Yeah. It's definitely part of our lives. Yeah. So uh, how, how does your faith, uh, how does that, um, well, how does that work into the company itself? We feel like, well, the customers are like family to us. I mean, it's, we have a lot of repeat customers and I feel like it's almost a ministry here. Like we try to encourage people. We try to just be helpful and pray for people. Yeah. People, you get to know people and they share stuff with you and they share, you get close to their family you hear problems and issues they're having and, we just try to be that positive light, you know, with them and yeah, you know, do whatever we can. So do you think that having a brick and mortar store um, helps you in that? Oh, yeah. You get, I mean, the internet is great. I mean, we have a, a website, which is great for people to see what we have available and stuff. But our niche is the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, for people to come in, be able to pick up and look at things for us to be able to talk about the product to them and, and just build that relationship. Uh, when my wife, my daughter and I were there, uh, my other daughter was, uh, well, she couldn't be there. She would have loved that store though. <laughs> uh, when we were there, we had a very warm feeling and there was no, uh, you know, it was, it was just a warm, uh, sense there and uh we we're just 
I don't know. I could see how that could be uh, the sort of place that I mean, if I lived in the area, I'd be a haunt, I'd be a ghost there. I'd be haunting that place. <laughs> but I could see how it's a place where, you know, people might gather. Uh, it seems like you do a lot of events and, and stuff. You were telling me about hammer ins and such. Uh, tell me about the kind of events you have at Willie Knives. So we have two main events a year in June, July. Uh, we have a case knives event. And then in the fall, we have our, or in October, we have our fall open house. And at both the events, we have tents set up outside. We have free food and drinks and sales and some demonstrations. We have a guy um, outside of Milford. He does um, beautiful Damascus. He brings uh, his equipment. He brings a 50 done hydraulic press and does some demonstrations on different Damascus and stuff like that. Then we have, um, sometimes we have a wood carver doing demonstrations out here. Um, for the fall open house, we have um, CJ Buck from Buck Knives will be coming signing Buck Knives this year. That's he was cool. here last year as well. But um, sales, door prizes, demonstrations a lot of our sales reps come for the fall open house and do different things um just a fun day we have a kids tent set up and have activities for the kids and music and just a, a great day to hang out and you can't beat free barbecue too yeah <laughs> <laughs> no you cannot uh you know uh it's it's interesting because being um, kind of where your store is, kind of amongst the fields and the, the cornfields. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of a rural location or it's just a rural location. Um, I could see how that could be a very popular store, uh, knife store. But the Delaware knife laws are, are, are uh, behind, uh, say, even Virginia. And I know Virginia only recently came into the into the light, uh, thanks to Knife Rights and and Doug Ritter, um, at all. Uh, but what about Delaware? What's it like running a knife store in Delaware, especially? And and what are some of the limitations of what you can carry, but what you can sell? How does that work? Right. So, concealed carry in Delaware is a three inch blade maximum limit. Um, you can open carry. A machete if you wanted to so if it's showing um if you have a fixed blade on your belt as long as it's showing you can you know the length isn't a deal but if it's concealed in your pocket then it's a three inch um yeah maximum blade length which can be difficult at times i don't know if it's enforced too strictly but it is yeah that is the law and there's no automatics legal in Delaware right now, but we are working on that. So AKTI, mm -hmm. um, who is an, another organization like Knife Rights, has come to us um, last October, and we started talking to them. And then this past April, they made some appointments to so we could all talk to some of our state senators and state representatives at Legislative Hall. And um, my daughter and I and two representatives from AKTI went and we had some really good meetings. And my state senator in my area, Dave Wilson, had introduced a bill, but it was right at the end of the session. Mm -hmm. Our session ends June 30th. So hopefully we will get that passed next session and we can start selling automatics, hopefully. Uh, I, I think the the good news uh, seems to be that it's a um, it's a much easier topic to broach uh, both sides of the aisle uh, than other things like guns. You know, um, I I hate to I, I I should say I hesitate to even draw the parallel, uh, but you know people kind of lump them together. However, mm -hmm. like that you can get a lot more. Um, support on both sides for something like knives because everyone has a pocket knife everyone uses them in the kitchen everyone or many people had granddads who you know gave right. them their first pocket knife or, or what have you um when when i was at your store and and also on the on your website perusing your uh brands the brands you represent mm -hmm. i was like huh i wonder if they have microtech because and and i and i said i said 
probably not because of the Delaware laws and Microtech's uh, Microtech has uh, a number of great non-automatic knives, but they're kind of known for their automatic knives. That's probably why people seek them out uh, more than half of the time. That's yeah. a totally unscientific assessment. But yeah, uh, we definitely would like to add Microtech. We've talked to them. We've talked to them at the Blade Show and, and different things. And and they do. They have a number of, of manuals that we'll probably go ahead and start putting in even before. We But we've been kind of waiting to see if we can start selling the auto soon. Like ProTech makes some, some really oh, yeah. nice autos as well that we'd love to carry. So is there, are, are there any brands that are particularly challenging to sell? Um, you know, because you have brick and mortar, but you also sell online. How does that, how does that work? Because I, I would assume you have to have the same prices, uh, whether you sell online or in a store. And does that vary? Uh, like it does. Up... So, yeah, I'm not sure how we can explain it too much online, but so we do like the prices. Um, some companies are very particular about their minimum advertised price. Oh, okay. um, we okay. can do in the store isn't as monitored is online where it's advertised. So we do have some companies that were actually a little cheaper in the store than we are online. Okay. All right. Yeah, I got you. So map pricing, uh, some companies do map pricing that doesn't allow you much flexibility. Other companies allow more flexibility and, and uh, okay. Cause I, I, I was wondering that cause we, Matt, you and I were kind of talking about this in the store a little bit and, uh, you know, cause I noticed your spider codes on the way out and I was like, Ooh, mm, you know, cause I'd already bought my knife and that was <laughs> it for the day, especially cause my wife was there. Uh, but <laughs> Love you, babe. No, uh, <laughs> but uh, I kind of sensed, oh, maybe Spyderco is a more difficult brand uh, than than some others. Uh, and I wasn't sure if it had to do with map pricing. I also know ZT does that kind of pricing. Um, well, I mean, sometimes it's a little bit better. I mean, it's kind of nice when they have map pricing because you got some big ones, big companies out there that, you know, we're going to be hard. It's going to be hard to compete with. I'm sure they buy a right. larger volume and, and stuff like that where the map pricing we can stay the same you know they can't undercut you know they have a, a limit to to sell at so i mean it's it's good in in a way as well so definitely helps your brick and mortar shops out there to right. compete especially online because yeah that's where a lot of sales are at anymore is online so we can compete with them as well Uh, you just broke up and froze on me there uh, yeah. in talking about map pricing at the uh, brick and mortar uh, store. Hopefully uh, you pop back in a second. Um, Can you uh, hear us now? Uh, and I want to find out what you were saying because you broke up, but you were talking about it makes it easier uh, in a brick and mortar. Uh, and I'm sure we'll find out about that. In just yeah. a second. Oh, there you go. Seems so, like you um, snap. Out. So I'm sorry. We missed that that little bit there. What were you saying? It makes it easier you know, when they have um, a minimum advertised price. Sometimes that way we're we're all on the same level there. It makes it easier to okay. compete. Okay, okay. I got you. All right, so I wanted to ask you, Matt, uh, you do a whole lot of sharpening. I'm sure this is a, a huge part of your day um, because you manage, I mean, you, you manage the knife collection or not collection you manage the knives uh, the working knives in a whole bunch of restaurants that's a whole bunch of sharpening you said you have uh some help there but um tell me what it's like kind of doing all that sharpening what it, what is the equipment you use and has it given you a taste for knife making yourself um i i do have a i want to get into knife making eventually um we stay so busy with with sharpening um we do at least 200 knives a day in sharpening if not more um, but we've got around 95 restaurants every two weeks they have to be delivered to uh you we drop off the sharp set pick up the doll set um but that's so that's that's most of my day right there is, is sharpening for the restaurants at the beach area at rehoboth yeah, lewis milton too. and we have a lot of walk-in sharpening comes in too uh, especially from hunting season to christmas 
Mm -hmm. We have a lot of walk-in sharpening that adds to that. Um, but, and, and you get some in the mail as well. We get some mail in sharpening, uh, that we always take in we try to get it right, mailed right back out within about two days after we get it in, we get it mailed back out to the person. So, yeah, I, I saw that on your, on your website. What do you, so it, is it different? Uh, the way you sharpen a knife, uh, is it different, uh, uh, when you're doing one of your rental blades for a Rehoboth beach restaurant or when you're doing uh, John down the streets, Bowie knife. So as far as the grit of the belt, the grit of the belt changes um, when I'm doing a customer's knife that comes in. Um, we, we use a, a Stephen Bader grinder to sharpen the knife, two by 72. And then to polish it and get that burr off, we use a real nice cloth wheel with a white rouge that, that gives it a real nice high polish on there. Mm -hmm. uh, gives it a real nice edge that lasts a long time instead of leaving that kind of rough burr on there. We make sure, I mean, I, I put in each time of each knife as it would be my own. Um, so that's my fault. And that's what dad instilled in us. Um, take your time, do it as if it's your own knives. Um, whether it's really a restaurant knife or whether it's a, a William Henry knife, that's two, $3,000. Mm -hmm. It just puts your, your time into it. Uh, so that's that's what I do. I make sure I put my time into each knife. It's just the belt um, course changes when when I do a restaurant versus customer. Um, so that's that's really the only thing that changes because even with restaurants, you want to make sure you take your time and and keep that that going. I mean, if if that quality starts diminishing, then the restaurants start diminishing. Well, not only that, but the quality of that edge. Diminishing also means the knife doesn't last last as long. Uh, I, I swear, some of the knives I used at at Bella Luna, which no longer exists, so I can say it. I swear it. They were sharpened on concrete. They, they were so they were almost like serrated blades when we got them. They were so uh, rough. Yeah, and, and then with the steel, that's a lot of time that we put into it. Is is the finish of the the edge to get that burr off? We really put a lot of time into finishing it off. Um, obviously, there's a fine line of when you're doing two, 250 knives a day, obviously you can't spend all day on a knife, but we still put a lot of time into each knife and, and put that nice polish on there. So there's no, there's no strong, there's no burr feel to it or anything like that. It's a nice smooth edge when you run your fingernail down it. So uh, being a sharpener, uh, I mean, among other things, uh, what are your favorite steels to sharpen? <laughs> um so that as far as a, a real nice edge when when you're finished with a higher end steel whether you're doing s35 vn or s90 v um obviously s90 v you're you're taking a lot more time to get that edge on than mm -hmm. s35 it's just that that harder steel but those higher end steels like that just have a nice feel to them versus doing something that's a real soft cheap steel that comes in isn't it hard to get the burr off on it's softer steel it's harder to hmm. it just has a different feel to it. it it is a little harder to get that that burr you just got to be a little more careful on the buffing wheel too when you're working with a, a softer steel um but a harder steel just has has a nicer feel has a nicer slice to it um so i i really enjoy doing s35 s45 vn and the new Magna Cut, well, not new-ish, um, it, it sharpens up really well, too, and, and holds a good edge. But I definitely enjoy doing a higher-end steel more than I do uh, a cheaper steel that comes in. Did you notice uh, the change kind of uh, when powder metallurgy became uh, the standard, uh, at least in higher-end steels? Did you notice the change uh, in in the performance when you're actually grinding and uh, trying to get your perfect edge? Yeah, when you're when you're using a, a belt like that, a two by seventy two, you'll you'll notice a little difference um, as far as sharpening goes. But yeah, when you're using a belt, you don't notice a whole lot of change, but there is that little bit of change there where you can see. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer to sharpen a knife with a, a little higher end steel, but um, it just it just has a nicer feel to it now with these newer 
newer steels. Uh, what do you what do you make of that? I mean, from your end, from my end as a collector, I mean, I'm talking about the all of the fancy high end steels. I mean, you both have been in the game for a long time for uh, uh, your whole lives. Um, I've I've only been really thinking about steel in in the way uh, you know the modern day knife snob thinks about steels uh, for the past you know five years or something like that. And uh, what what do you make of of the super steel? I'm going to say revolution. That sounds so corny, but just, you know, it's like a market uh, force. Uh, now everyone's got to worry about steel. Was it always like this? No. I mean, I mean, buck and case for years. I mean, they use 420 HC and that was it. Now it's almost like, you know, everybody just like when they come in and they want to say, well, what new knife do you have now? It's like, what new steel is there? It's getting a little, overwhelming i think really when you get into some of these good steals i don't know how much the average person's really going to see the difference in yeah. in some of them honestly yeah yeah no no i've i've thought about this a lot because i've had to justify to myself spending more money on on a on a steel that i will know i mean you know i know I, 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 I can't push the cheapest, softest steel. To, well, maybe maybe the worst, cheapest Walmart steel. Maybe I can uh, push it to its limit. But I just don't have the lifestyle where I'm using my knives a lot. Uh, I, I sharpen them. I, I, I strop them more than I use them. Let me put it that way. Uh, you know, a part of me wishes that weren't the case. But I'm a collector, you know, uh, at heart. I, to me, it's like, oh, um, it's like... It's like buying a Ferrari with the expensive wheels or, or, or with the extra cylinders in the engine or whatever it is. I'm trying to make a car analogy, but I haven't bought an exotic car. So it's like, it's like that add on. You like knowing it's there, even though you're not using it. It's like an added value. Um, and does that make knives easier to sell? Would you say? It, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely a, good point of interest like somebody I mean, a lot of the guys they come in they're buying work knives it's probably everyday carry knives is what we sell the most of and they want something to hold a good edge which i totally get so i mean you they want a step up from you know like a usc you know they want a, a good steel so once you get in and hit even like 154 cm and above i mean you've got a good steal. Yeah. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I love, I love 154. Um, and I think that, that uh, the material thing is exciting for people. And, but there's also like, there's, there's the way it is supposed to behave, you know, like M390 is like super sharp and has uh, great resistance to uh, corrosion, but there are also uh, appealing things like, Damascus, uh, Damascus and Damascene type steels and stuff. And something that I thought was cool when I was at Willie Knives, uh, your your store, uh, there were when we walked in, there was a couple. They were they were way younger and way hipper. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we were hip once. No, not <laughs> true. Uh, no, but they were young, hip people. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Like they're, you know, when you see at Blade Show, you see just all uh, you want to talk about mm -hmm. diversity, which a lot right. of people like to talk about. That's where you see like the 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 craziest spread of people. And it's great. And and seeing this young hip couple who were, uh, you know, looked like they were going to go and do something cool at an art gallery or something, uh, perusing the knives and just kind of overhearing them talk about it. It made me feel great. I was like, see, this is a this is a unifying thing. Everyone loves mm -hmm. knives. How cool. And I asked the guy what he was carrying. And he had the little Civivi thug with the, with the, with the really nice uh, sort of Damascus blade. When you have people come in who are looking for something, but they don't know what they want, um, how do you kind of steer them in the direction of what they should get? You have a wide variety of stuff there. Yeah, we start out asking them questions like, you know, is it an everyday carry, or are you looking for a hunting knife? What are you using it for? What kind of purpose are you going to use it for? What size do you like? I'll bring out, I'll pull out like what I'm carrying that day and say, you know, is that kind of a size you're looking for? Something smaller, something bigger. And, um, and just get information from them and kind of a price point, you know, they like to, to stay in. And then we just start pulling stuff out. Like, do you want something with a pocket clip? 
you know, do you want to sink it in your pocket or you want to carry it on a sheath and, and just start asking questions. Matt, you were going to say something. Uh, uh, that's one great thing I love about having this shop is when people come down, you can kind of figure out what they're using it for. And, and then you can guide them towards certain steels because some steels are going to be more brittle than others. So if they're going to be really abusing it, you don't want to go with a really hard steel because it'll nick a little easier. So it that's one good thing that I do like about having this shop is you can talk to the people and, and it's obviously about having a relationship with them and getting to know them, especially around this area, but um, also just, what kind of what kind of steel they would like and what suits them best like she was saying uh what brand do you find you sell the most benchmade is is probably is our biggest seller and um probably buck is probably right behind that we do a lot with buck and and case and kershaw then it kind of kind of blends in there um but Bench meets a, a really big seller for us. That doesn't surprise me. And 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 uh, I I personally, and I don't mean to talk about a, a brand that you sell, but I'm I'm kind of hot and cold with Benchmade. Uh, I have a few that I absolutely love. Um, and then and then there are some that I look at and I'm like, I I'd like to have that, but I'm not gonna go buy it. And then um, and then there are some benchmades. I'm just like, why did they put that out? That looks just like so many other benchmades. Uh, but they're made in America and it's a great American company with an awesome history. And I find that I, I work kind of alongside sometimes uh, first responders. I'm not a first responder at all, uh, but I talk to them and I ask them what they carry uh, cops and firefighters. And so often it's a bench made. Why do you think that is? They seem to really support um, law enforcement, military and, and stuff like that. So um I don't know. And they probably, they do a lot of advertising in that area too. So they probably tend to tend to like, like that style and like the, the Benchmade knife, but yeah, Benchmade's been around for a long time. We were actually um, with less before it was Benchmade and it was Pacific cutlery and all they made was butterfly knives. Oh yeah. And they've got a good warranty. They really are easy to deal with on the phone. If you have an issue with them. Yeah. They back um, their product really yeah. well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I had, uh, I just had a preference for a different clip, and I, 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 I sent them an email and stated that I was like, nothing happened to my clip, but I'd really love one of those little uh, bug out clips. And they're like, here you go, and they, you know, cost them more to send it to me than it cost to, you know, manufacture it. So uh, that was that actually a, a nice way of doing it. That's that's good yeah, customer they service. Us, we have a a clip, a whole bench made clip kit they provide for us. So. Oh, if nice. a guy comes in, we can just switch out. If they break a clip, we can just put a new one on right here. Uh, what what companies would you say? And I'm also not asking you to 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 call out favorites, but what companies, from your perspective, are the easiest to work with? You mentioned Benchmade. Um, well, what else? Buck what other companies? One are? That has a really good warranty. Who? I'm sorry. Buck, I... Buck Knives has oh. a really good. They call theirs a forever warranty. Um, Actually, uh, I mean, a lot of our companies really back their products. For the, for an industry, I think knives, the knife industry, really has typically really backs their products. Well, at least, I guess, I mean, we carry probably a little maybe higher end, you know, knives. But they tend to really, really do back their products well. It's interesting. Uh, uh, some of my YouTube colleagues uh, will, if they have uh, a an issue with a knife uh, that they've reviewed, they'll send it in for warranty work, uh, but they won't say, I have a channel and, and I'm going to talk about this. Uh, and they just get a read on, on the customer service. That's always kind of interesting to me. <laughs> and it makes me wonder in speaking with you, if the customer service is stepped up, maybe just a touch, if you're, uh, uh, you know, a store that sells their product um, as opposed to uh, John Q public. That's yeah. But I'll tell you, most of them, they want to deal direct with the customer now. So hmm. we tend to almost stay out of it. Will if I've got, but a lot of them, you fill out the form online and I've got some customers that just don't like to do 
the internet a whole lot. So gotcha. if they have a broken knife, I, I help them. We just whip out the laptop and we start filling out, I fill out the form, help them fill out the form and give them a box and they can box it up and send it back themselves. And I just print out the form for them. Yeah. For, for a long time, we, we used to send the knives back for the customers uh, for years and over years I'd, I'd call them and, and, they just started going more towards wanting to deal with the customer. And they'll, they'll tell oh. you that over the last couple of years, it's changed. They, they want to deal straight with the customer. Well, that's actually really great news because, um, I mean, it comes up a lot on this show, how, um, you know, on the whole, you can't say about everything or everyone, but on the whole, the knife, um, uh, industry and, uh, the sort of community that's, uh, built up around it is, you know, pretty forward, straight dealing and kind of very cool. I mean, when I talk to knife makers, which is pretty much every week, they all talk about how they're an open book and how other people reach out to them. They reach out to other uh, knife makers for I ideas about how to do certain things. Certain, and, and it's like, uh, there's an understanding. Yeah, I'll give you my trick, but that doesn't make your knife my knife. So take my trick and do what your thing with it. Uh, that sort of spirit seems to seems to permeate the industry. Um, are you saying that you kind of feel it from your end too? Oh yeah, yeah. The it's just I don't know. I think it it's just a smaller maybe it's a smaller industry, and it's just I mean if you go to the blade show and even we see it some at Shot Show, you know when we go around to just more of the knife companies and stuff. But it's just I don't know. It's just a close knit community, I think. You know how they say uh, an armed society is a polite society. I think there's there's a little bit of that too. And and you know I I look at knives as arms as well as tools, and um, I think most people, being honest, do as well. Um, <laughs> not that we all carry them as weapons, but you know we all recognize the danger in them. Um, and and I think that that having a uh, little community or, or like-minded individuals based around something that's kind of like that, uh, but also necessary. Um, kind of, it, it's sort of a magical uh, uh, combination as opposed to things that might be 100% dangerous that just might draw a weird crowd. I don't know. I don't know, but even <laughs> exactly know how to put a finger on it, but it, but there's a real sense of uh, esprit de corps, you know, with uh, mm -hmm. the knife world. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you if you have, you know, you live in an area where people are coming into your store and they're asking you about, have you ever had anyone come in and say, uh, I'm going to war or my son is going off to, to war. What, what should he bring? And if so, like, what have you recommended? We've had some go overseas, um, you know, that were in the military. Um, I had one guy, it was in not too long ago, actually. And he had, this was back a few years ago. He had, come in with his son and wanted to get him a good knife that he was going overseas with. And, and dad had recommended and he got a, um, I forget if it was a Pacifica or a green beret from Chris Reeve. And yeah, he loved it. He was saying how, how well it just, it was, it was like the perfect knife for him. So, but well, yeah, I mean, I we sell, and we sell K-Bar and, you know, there's Spartan and all those a number of the ones. Yeah. We have a lot of great knives to pick from. It's just kind of personal preference. What, you know, what sticks out to them. I hope that young man got to keep that amazing, beautiful knife because I know <laughs> a lot of stuff gets stolen uh, in, in out in the field. Uh, but man, what that's an amazing, uh, yeah, that would be a, an amazing one. Uh, to take. So uh, let me ask you, you know, as we, as we start to wrap here, what, where do you see Willie knives uh, in the future? And, and what I mean by that is like, uh, do you want to grow and uh, to grow your online business or do you want to grow your sharpening business or uh, how, how do you see the company in the future? Yeah, we've talked about it and, you know, for the longest time we just, wanted to just stay doing what we were doing kind of here. But we, when we think about like a five to 10 year goals out, we would really like to build a store on the corner. Um, not that we want to get into a major, you know, 
metropolitan area, but mm -hmm. we would like to get it out of the basement. You know, you have people, we offer curbside service, but I mean, you still, you've got people that would love to see the store that can't, you know, get down the steps, you know, they've had knee surgery or they're elderly or mm -hmm. handicapped, and many different reasons. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a goal we have now is to be able to build a store and make it a little larger and expand a little offer some more companies and and yeah the sharpening service and we would like to we just updated our website last july and we've gotten great results from that but i mean that can used to we like to improve that as well but at least we got a starting point and just the things we would like to add to it and do differently but yeah i think that's the main um growing area that we we want to increase is our website sales i mean that's where everything's going anymore but um yeah our, our in shop can only get so big in this area um mm -hmm. obviously we want to build a bigger store for more stores but the website sales is definitely where everything's at. Um, and then sharpening service, of course, I could, I would like to bring uh, some more people in and we could, we could build that bigger as well. I mean, we do a great job at our sharpening service uh, and we, we don't get any complaints. It's, we have a great edge and that's what I enjoy doing. And uh, just to reiterate, you take, uh, you take sharpening work, uh, by mail, you know, if someone wants to send you uh, a box of knives to sharpen, you you take them, you sharpen them, you have them out in a, in a few days, and you've got the willy edge on it. Yep, whether it's pocket knives, kitchen knives, scissors, um, that's what those things we try to deal with with those. I don't go much outside of that, but yes, we we do. Whether it's a Chris Reeve knife or whether it's uh, just a, a smaller everyday carry pocket knife um but yeah and a lot of kitchen knives we do a lot of shoon and and wust off and and oh. we we have a lot of shoon and wust off on display as well and on our website and other kitchen companies too you know funny funny thing is when i was in your store um i knew that you know i we had a limited time there because we got there about a half hour before closing and um and i knew that i wanted something you know tactical and uh you know combative and i was walking through your store like making notes oh i gotta come back here and over there and over there and i got to the kitchen area and i was like okay this is cool these are all kitchen knives i don't need those and i turned around <laughs> you know what i mean like uh, i like the layout of your store <laughs> and, it and down. Yeah, for, a, for a nerd who's there for only a half hour it was it was really easy to navigate now i'd be remiss if i let you go two people who own a knife store and have been around knives your whole life uh, if I didn't ask uh, each one of you what your absolute favorite knife is, and let's keep it to something that anyone could get. <laughs> uh, that is so hard because, well, I don't know. I guess we all have our views. One of my favorite is Benchmade. I carry, I like the access lock, mm -hmm. so I have a mini bug out that I carry sometimes a full immunity. Um, Matt likes the, the Osborne's as well. Uh, for, um, for years I've carried the 940 Osborne. Um, the mini tagged out. I really like it came in from Benchmade recently. Oh, yeah. um, I like the size of it. Of course in Delaware with our three inch law, you know, we've got the, the one thing, though, too, I didn't mention. So if you have your concealed carry permit mm -hmm. in Delaware, it covers the length of your blade. So you don't have to. That gets you around. You can carry longer blades um, as long as you have your concealed carry. But, yeah, that's a little off topic. Another one of my favorite, as far as case knives go, like a traditional pocket knife, I like the um, the mini copper lock. That's oh, yeah. No, I think... Oh, you got another one? Yeah, I like that. I can't ask somebody like, why yeah. one knife? Oh my goodness. The Buck Sprint, the upgraded one with the my card yeah. handle. Yeah. Yeah, it's my card handle. Yeah. And what about you, Matt? So as far as what I have in my pocket right now, um, 
I just recently got a ZT452 with the blue carbon fiber Ooh, nice. and then the magna cut steel. Um, I just I don't always carry a knife this large, but I do have a permit to to carry, so I can carry this legally. Uh, but I, I like the look of it more than anything. But it's it's just I like blue carbon fiber and obviously the magna cut. I wanted to try it out. So yeah. that's something something new that we carry in the shop and and that I carry that I, I really like. I love the, the look and the feel of that. Um, as far as overall for, for years, um, and I still do, the 940 Benchmade has been one of my favorites. I just like the feel of it. It's It's got nice length to it for feel, but it's still skinny enough where you don't feel like you have a big knife in your pocket. Hmm. Um, and then I also like the, the Hogue Deca with the Magnet oh, yeah. Steel black polymer handles worn clip blade that's that's a sweet knife that's a nice carry for every day such a good looking worn cliff i love that thing yeah all right well jerry and matt thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast it's been really interesting talking with you about not only the background of your company and i think uh, the story that leads up to today is fascinating and adds a lot to um why people love your store and 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 would come to Willie Knives, but also uh, I, I, it was just a thrill for me to be in your shop and and to know that they exist outside of uh, the, the bubble I live in here. Well, thank you so much for having us. And I'm so glad that your wife spotted our sign. On the, on the I, know, <laughs> I know, me too. Me too. Uh, we will talk more and I will probably be sending you some knives for sharpening as soon as I can, you know, figure out which ones need to need that. Looking um, forward to it. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. See ya. Adventure Delivered, your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor, survival, EDC, and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals. Theknifejunkie.com slash battle box. There they go, ladies and gentlemen, Jerry and Matt Willie of Willie Knives, a true American dream knife story, multi-generational love of knives. Uh, I love that. Check out Hebrews uh, 4.12 uh, for that full verse. Uh, it's, it's, it's awesome. Uh, and be sure to join us Thursday night for uh, Thursday night uh, uh, for, I'm sorry, Thursday night knives. And also Wednesday for the midweek supplemental uh, where we will be going over some uh, new stuff in the market. All right. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.